Okay, so welcome to chapter six, public opinion and political action. In this chapter, uh, by the end of this chapter, we should be able to know or understand these learning objectives. Contrast the relative positions of African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, and Native Americans in the American political and economic spheres. Identify the political implications of an increasingly elderly population. Describe the process of political so socialization and identify the primary agents of socialization. Outline the components that are essential to obtaining accuracy in public opinion poll. Evaluate, evaluate the role of polls in American democracy. Identify the political beliefs that are likely to be preferred by liberals and conservatives. Identify the activities that encompass political participation in the United States. Be able to distinguish between conventional and unconventional types of political participation. Show how nonviolent civil disobedience was one of the most effective techniques of the civil rights movement in the American South. And lastly, explain what political scientists mean when they conclude that Americans are ideological conservatives but operational liberals. Um, so before I begin, let's give you an introduction, overview of the chapter. Uh, in the representative democracy that we live in today, you and me as citizens of this democracy, the prefer um, preferences are supposed to guide policymakers. The people we elect into office are supposed to be ones who guide the people who actually make the policy decisions and, and vote on laws that affect us every day. Yet the American people are amazingly diverse, which means that there is no there are many groups within our diverse country with opinions um, rather than one single opinion, no one, not one person agrees on one thing across the border in America with our diverse opinions. And so most citizens know very, and even though that is true, we have all these diverse opinions, most citizens have very little, they know very little about politics. So this chapter is going to focus on the nature of these public opinions, how citizens have, citizens have learned, how citizens learn about politics and the extent to which these op opinions are conveyed to government officials through various ways of political participation. So let's look at the American people first in um, public opinion. So even though, like I said, the United States is, remains one of the most diverse countries in the world today, the study of American public opinion aims to understand the distribution of the population's belief about politics and policy issues. Getting a public's opinion is trying to figure out where do we where do we stand? What does America stand on every different issue out there? That's what public opinion is that's what trying to do, understand that. Uh, such diversity though makes the study of American public opinion especially complex for there are many groups with a great variety of opinions, and that goes back to the diversity that we have here in a country. This task is further complicated by the fact that people are often not well informed about the issues and they have and they may have contradictory attitudes. So due to because that since we're not really informed, it's kind of it makes it hard to really understand what people's opinion really is if they really don't know what they're talking about or what their real opinion is on the issue itself. And um, there are there are consequences for this for democracy and the least informed people are also the least likely to participate in the political process in the first place which thereby leads to inequalities in who takes part in political action because if you think about it who are the least likely to be informed or the people who are least likely educated which means that they're the ones that are not going to participate and therefore there's an, in, an inequality when it comes to who is actually making these helping to make these decisions for our country um, so one way of looking at the American public is through the demography, uh, demo demography, uh, which is a science of population change. How how does um, how does a population change throughout the time? And the most valuable tool for understanding the demographic changes in America is the census that takes place every ten years. The first one was conducted in 1970 to comply with the constitutional requirement that the government conducts an actual enumeration or um, numbering of the population every 10 years and this is to determine how many representatives each state gets um, 
when it comes to voting for and into the members, um, how many how many representatives each state gets in the House of Representatives. So it's very critical that we have the census and people actually participate in the census. Um, once a group can establish its numbers, it then can ask for federal aid in proportion to its side, and that's why it's key to to uh, one of you partaking a census, just so if depending on what census says, you can get more 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 money from federal governments from like federal grants or block. I'm um, sorry, federal um, categorical grants um, to um, number of representation in Congress. So the demogra the demographics of our country is is huge um, a huge thing to to know about and. Our, the United States has always been a nation of immigrants, and the most value. I'm sorry, the Americans Americans live in a multicultural and mi multilingual society that is becoming more diverse all the time. So we're keep continuing to be diverse. We are a diverse country as it begin with, in our because of our opinion, but with the different cultures and, and languages that are um, that our country continues to allow to come in. Um, it just makes us even more diverse. And despite this diversity, though, you have minority groups who have assimilated many of the basic American values, such as the principle of equality or liberty or um, freedom to, um, to vote or to um, practice your own religion. These are many basic American values that these minority groups have assimilated to or are taken kin to despite their backgrounds or where they come from. And until recently, the largest minority group in the country has been the African American population. However, the 2000, uh, even or the 2010 census reports that the, for the first time, well, since 2000 census, for the first time, the Hispanic population um, outnumbered the African American population, making them the largest minority majority minority, which means they're the they're the largest minority group, the Hispanic population today. And unlike Hispanics who have come to America to escape poverty, the recent influx of Asians has been driven has been driven by a new class of professional workers looking for a greater opportunity. So Hispanics have come here due to, to try to get away from poverty. Asians, though, have come here and have created this new uh, middle class or working class professional workers um, in our society. Um, and then you have African Americans who were brought here by slaves, and they've struggled, um, but from early on in our society, but have um, done well with such, um, you know, after civil rights have laws have been passed, and then you have um, the Native Americans, who by far are the worst off minority group um, today in America, even though they've been here the longest, they're the worst off when it comes to the different minority groups here in America. Um, They've, they haven't necessarily wanted to assimilate into American culture because they they were always anti-American. Um, that's part of the reason why they were moved around, shipped around because they didn't really they didn't ever wanted to be a part of America, and still today some of them still don't want to be part of American today. So that's part of the reason why they're they're worse off because they haven't assimilated um, into our culture as much. And then regardless of ethnic background, though most Americans share a common political culture. Um, an overall set of values widely shared within a society, and that goes back to you know, freedoms, liberties, justice, equality. These are all um, common political culture that most Americans agree with that we should have. Even though we come from all different countries and different nations and have speak different languages, once you get here, most of the time these people, these minority groups, assimilate or take on this culture that we have here, that we, we've created in America. Um, so over time, though, our, our population has changed. Uh, the last 50 years, much of America's population growth has been centered in the West and in the South, particularly with movement to the Sun Belt states of Florida, California, and Texas. Um, people move there from the Rust Belt states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan, making the South and West a more populated area compared to others. So our, our, our population started in the East and the Midwest or um, the, the northern part of the Midwest, and over time, our population has been changing to, to the south and to the west. 
And the process of reapportionment, which occurs every 10 years, it's for the part of the census, um, this, um, every 10 years following, following the census, it brings with it a, a gains or losses of congressional representation as the state's population balances changes. Uh, like I said, most people are moving from the east and the northern Midwest area into these southern and western states, and because of that, they're losing seats in the, in the east part of the country, while the west and south are gaining more seats in Congress due to reapportionment every 10 years due from the census. Uh, so gains or losses of congressional representation in Congress. Uh, the fastest growing age group in America, though, is composed of citizens over age, age of 65. They're the fastest growing. So people are moving from the moving to the south and west. The fastest group of people is the age over 65, and that's because of baby boomers. Um, most of them are now over 65 for the most part. And and also because they're living longer as a result of medical advances in the birth rate um, medical advances in the birth rate following not following and that's even going down even more because of the recession there are less people having babies um, you got 65 people um, people who are, who are over 65 are getting are the fastest age group and then social security system which was uh, which is second to the national defense and most costly public policy the growing demands to care for these elderly people 65 and older um, will almost certainly become more acute in the decades ahead, and we're seeing even more so today. They have such such power when it comes to Congress and influence on members of Congress and the president because there's so there's so many of them. And when it comes to Social Security and protecting that, they have a lot of power in, in influencing what they do or don't do when it comes to Social Security, just because of their large age group, large number of them in that age group. So. That is the American people. We have a diverse opinion, and our public opinion is trying to figure out what those diverse opinions are. Um, to figure out how many people live in the in our country, we have a census every ten years, and we're a nation of immigrants, so we have a bunch of different cultures and languages in our society, and um, and within this, we have our minority groups, which is the largest: Hispanic, then you got African Americans, and you got Asians, and the smallest of these groups is Native Americans. And despite all these different multicultures, there we are. Um, we share a common political culture. And over the years, the population has been shifting from the east and from the north to the west and the south. And um, the fastest age group is 65 and older, due to baby boomer and longer, longer um, living people and less people being less people having babies. So, how does Americans learn about politics or in other words, political socialization. So how does Americans learn? Uh, well, political sociali socialization is the definition, the process through which an individual acquires his or her own political orientations, their own whereabouts or where they're at politically. Um, so how do, you, how do you individually know your political orientation? Well, it's a process. Only a small portion of Americans Political learning is formal. Most of it's done informally, informal learning, which is uh, even more important. The way you, you, the process through which you acquire your political or orientation is more likely to be informal rather than formal. We're going to talk about that here. Um, agents of socialization are are numerous. There are many ways you can be politically socialized. Uh, this includes your family, the media, and schools. Um, the family's role. Is central because of its monopoly on two crucial crucial resources in the early years of your life, um, both time and emotional commitment, and they may even be genetic. There may be even genetic reasons towards your attitudes um, politically, based on your genetics. You can have a certain political uh, attitude. Uh, the mass media has a ha also plays a role in this political socialization. Uh, the mass media has been referred to as the new parent due to the fact that so many people today grow up watching TV and uh, are, are looking things up on the internet more so even today than TV. But because of that, being that parent, this is where most people form their political uh, orientations or their um, how they learn about politics is through the, their media and through TV and internet and um, video games or whatever it may be. It needs to form a mass media.
And then the last main way we're politically socialized is through the school. Um, governments throughout the world use schools to attempt to instill a commitment to their very basic values of the system. And in America, we do this when we have you have everyone in the morning recite the Pledge of Allegiance, or we you know we recite it here at school too, even high school. Um, but in the Pledge of Allegiance, you are saying these you're saying these words that you're going to you kind of are you relate to and you uh, agree about. Um, that's part of the political socialization of, of training you to think a certain way, um, politi politically, that is. So how does American learn? Just, it's a process, and more likely than not, you learn from your family, the media, and schools itself. Okay, politics, it's a lifelong activity, so it's not something you, you know, early on in your life, you, you are shown a lot of things from your school and family, um, but it's a lifelong activity, and it, it always, it's always changing. It's never, it's never going to stay the same. You're always going to, this process is always going to change throughout your life. Um, aging increases, and the older you get, it increases your political participation and also your strength of one party's attachment. As you get older, you're going to want to participate more because you're going to find that government affects you more and more, even though it affects you, even though it's, it affects you today. But you're going to see why, you're going to see it impact you on a more personal level, especially because when you start paying taxes, um, when you pay taxes and out of your coming, it's coming your paycheck, that's going to make you think a little bit differently about maybe what the government should do or shouldn't do. Um, so the older you get, the more the more participation you're going to, you're more likely to participate and become attached to one's party also. Um, political behavior is, is, to some degree, a learned behavior, and this goes back to what you learn from your family and watching stuff on TV. And lastly, Governments largely, I'm sorry, yeah, governments largely aim their socialization efforts at a young age, not the old, because one's, because one's political orientations grow firmer as one becomes more socialized with age. So basically, you're, you're more flexible to change in your ideas when you're younger, and this is why governments would choose to try to socialize you early on, because they can, they can change your opinion. But as you get older and older, you become um, more of a... Um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? You're just you're more stubborn in what you, in what you believe in, and you're less likely to change your mind. So you want to, even though it's a lifetime lifelong activity, you always would be maybe changing things. But the older you get, it's less likely to change. So political socialization is this process of how you learn about politics, and you're usually going to learn this through your family, mass media, schools, and it's a lifelong thing that the older you get the more likely you participate and you learn this through through all these different outlets and it's easier to change your mind when you're younger than older you get more stubborn so it's how do we measure a public opinion how does how does the government find out what the public opinion is or what they what they want what do the people want so what americans believe and believe they know is what's that's what's called public opinion what americans believe um, the distribution of people's beliefs about politics and pol policy issues, though, um, are, are scattered throughout. So what Americans believe and, and believe they know is different throughout all of America. Um, there is rarely a single public opinion. You know, maybe one, a close example to being a single public opinion was shortly after 9-11, I would say for the huge majority of the public, what would be would be to go to war to try to find and hunt down Osama bin Laden, and probably even today, that that was the case when Osama was was killed. There was probably that's like probably the closest you can think of of being the same, of public opinion being the same. Um, I'm sure there's there's of course there's going to be people out there who would think that was not the good thing to do, but you're really going to have a single public opinion because of our diversities of people in our country. Um, so there are there are many opinions out there. Um, public opinion is one of the products of political learning. This is how the government learns how what the public wants or doesn't want is trying to figure out what the opinion is of you, the public. So because of that, they need to learn. There's got to be a certain way of measuring public opinion. There's there is a system. There is a um, a way of doing this, a scientific way of doing this. That is. And the way they way that government officials or people 
like um, the Gallup poll. They measure public opinion is through polling. Uh, public opinion polling was first developed by George Gallup in 1932. Um, polls rely on a sample of the population. It's, in, it's impossible to poll everyone in America. So it's, it's a sample of the population, a relatively small portion of the people who are chosen to be representatives of the whole country. Or it could be if it's a poll for the state of Nevada, it could be for the representation of the whole state, depending on whatever that universe is. And so this is how they measure public opinion, getting a small sample that represent the whole. Um, a good sample is about 15 to 2,000 people um, that represents the universe, which is the larger group whose opinion is being measured. So the universe is the, is the, the babe, the, everyone you were trying to figure out their opinion is, but of course you can't, you can't ask everyone their opinion, so you get a sample of the universe. That's what they call it, the universe. So the universe is the larger group whose opinion is being measured. Um, the key to an accuracy, to an accurate opinion of opinion poll is ha to have a random sampling, which operates on the principle that everyone should have an equal probability of being selected. So in this polling, the sample of the universe, it has to be random where everyone in that sample has an equal, everyone in that universe has an equal probability of being selected itself to have a really good accurate poll. Um, th there's always a certain amount of risk when you're doing a poll. Um, this is known as a sampling error. And when you ever see a poll, if it's, you'll see like a plus minus somewhere on the poll that indicates it can go either way, up or down, plus or minus. Um, if it's four or less, it's a pretty good poll. If it's five, and it's okay, but anything, usually anything of plus minus above five, the poll is really not that strong. It's not a good, it's not a good, um, they, they didn't do a good job on polling the universe. So you want a sampling of at least four or less to be a good, accurate um, indicator of what the public opinion is. Um, and today with technology that we have available for measuring public opinion, uh, like computers and telephone, this has made surveying less expensive and more commonplace today. Um, most polling is done on the telephone with samples selected throughout a random digit dialing system where calls are placed to telephone numbers within a randomly chosen exchange. The problem is with this is that we live in an era of cell phones and many pollsters are starting to worry whether this methodology will continue to work with everyone having cell phones and not having home phones to a landline to call and trying to figure out what the opinions are. And they're going to have to figure out a way of getting around that. And I guess the only way they can do that is if they start getting a hold of our cell phones. Um, and also another thing is a lot of people don't even want to take polls and they don't want to be a part of it. So that makes it difficult as well to measure public opinions because they don't want to be bothered by someone calling them. So how does the role of polls, what's the role of polls in American democracy? Well, supporters of polling, they believe that it's a tool for democracy, trying to figure out what we believe in, um, by which policymakers can keep in touch with changing opinions and issues. If we want policymakers, people in, in, the, in institutions that can affect us by making laws or passing laws, if we want them to know what to do, then this is a good way for them to keep in touch with what our opinions are so they can responsibly represent us. However, there are critics to this um, polling. Critics of polling think it makes politicians more concerned with following than leading. They're just following what the crowd wants, what the majority wants, instead of actually being leaders and making sound decisions on behalf of everyone, not just the, the majority of people who are actually taking part in the polls. Um, and this may let, and this may lead to discouraging bold leadership because they're just following what the what the polls say. Okay, polls can even weaken democracy by distorting the election process. Uh, polls are often accused of creating a bandwagon effect, in which voters may support a candidate only because they see what that others are doing. So, so when it comes to election day. Or when it comes to just what who's what um what people are saying in the polls, people just kind of ha hop on along and say, "Oh, um, Rick Perry, he's leading the Republicans in 
in the polls right now, well then I'm just gonna hop along his 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 bandwagon and support him because that seems like everybody else is supporting. So I'll just go along with everyone else. They don't care to look to see what their actual policies are with everyone running. They just go along with everyone else. They get on the bandwagon. So polls do this. They create this bandwagon effect. Um, and then having emphasis on polls also results in drowning out the issues of recent um, and presidential campaigns rather than so rather than focusing on the issues they just look at the polls like where are you at in the polls here I am in the polls what, what can I do to get myself in the polls and we don't really concentrate what they're what they stand on on the issues so it drowns those issues out um, on election day we'll be, we have what's called exit polls and this is one of the most criticized type of polls um, today and the reason why is when you have exit polls and people see early results in election on election day, they may not go out and vote, especially on the West Coast. So if they see polls going on, they see what, what people are voting on on the East Coast, and they're coming in, and they see, oh, this person's already going to win, then they don't want to they don't want to vote, and so they don't even go out to vote. Um, or sometimes exit polls analysts will say, based on these exit polls, they'll declare a winner before they even before everyone's even voted and. Sometimes they can be wrong, and this is what happened in uh, in Florida. Exit polls showed that Gore won. Um, even some some news organizations like CNN, I believe, they declared that Gore was the winner of the presidential election when he was going against George Bush, and um, they were wrong. George Bush eventually was the winner of Florida, and he won the presidency. So exit polls can be can be are criticized just because they're not they can deter people to voting and also they can be wrong analysts can be wrong on what the, the exit polls are saying when everyone's not done voting and then uh, perhaps the most per, per, uh, pervasive criticism of polling is that pollsters can get pretty much the results any get any result they want just by wording the question a certain way although biases in such question questions may be easy to detect uh, ethically the problem is that any organization may not report how they survey questions were worded and just by looking at the the word you may be confused and you just vote you you reply a certain way and you really don't truly feel that way you just didn't really understand what they were trying to get at and um, this is one way pollsters can get results in their favor just by wording it a certain way so these are all criticism of, of polling um, the good thing is though it, it is a way for the for policymakers to understand what we believe in if you believe that's what people really believe in. Um, what do polls reveal about Americans' political information? Not Nothing very good, I'll tell you that. Um, polls reveal that average Americans have a lower level of political knowledge than citizens of other countries at similar levels of development. So what polls are showing is you don't, we don't really know much about our politics. Um, and part of the reason the American political system works as well as it does is that people do not know what they do know, I'm sorry, they do know what basic values they want to uphold. Even though they do not have information on the policy questions or decisions, they know what their basic value is like. I'm, I'm, I'm basically, I value um, government being helping us out in some way, or maybe I don't want government to help me out. That's a value I just, I know. And so Americans do know their basic values of what they, what maybe what government should or shouldn't do, even though they don't know every little detail about every little policy that a government, our government handles and takes and uh, has to come up with answers for. Um, increased levels of education and the increased availability of information over the last decades have scarcely raised public knowledge about politics and this can maybe be due to our public cynicism or sarcasm and mistrust of government. Um, because of that this undermines the ability of the government to ad address pressing social problems due to our lack of knowledge, our mistrust, our sarcasm of how we perceive government. Um, so this is what polls reveal. We're not really knowledgeable. We do know what our basic values are. And even though we increase our education and um, the availability of learning about information or policies, um, we still mistrust don't or yeah, mistrust the government in handling problems. So uh, that's what that's what polls reveal about us, political, our political knowledge. Uh, what do Americans value? 
our political ideologies. So who are the liberals and who are the conservatives? That's what ideologies, political, political ideology is the value and beliefs about public policy that someone has, a set of values and beliefs that a, on public policy that you have. And usually people are going to be thrown into a liberal ide ideology or a conservative ideology. Um, overall, though, most Americans or more Americans consistently choose the ideology label of conservative rather than liberal. And most Americans are either, well, they're going to be moderate or conservative. But even though the, most people Americans are conservatives, there are, there are groups, some groups who are more liberal than others, and they want to see the government do more. Um, and these include people, people who are under age of 30, minorities, and women. These are more likely, these groups of people are more likely to be liberal than any other group of people. So let's look at these different groups. Um, if you're under 30 years old, the younger you are, the more likely to be liberal. And this kind of goes, and so as you get older, you're, you're, you are more likely to become conservatives. And if you look at um, numbers, most Americans who are conservatives are over 65 years old. Um, so that's just due to the fact, again, it kind of goes back to your education, your, your um, um, how much you may be being taxed. Um, the younger you are, you're not, you're not really, you're not really filling the government on your back as much, and so you may be more liberal in that in that thinking. And compared to as you get older, you get more conservative. So under 30, younger, you're more likely to be liberal. Um, minorities, which is another group that's more likely to be liberal, they they have looked over throughout our history. They are the ones that looking. They look to government to help fix the inequalities in their life. That they feel like they're being mistreated, and if you look like out of African Americans having to fight for civil rights and liberties, um, they look to the government to do that. And because of that, because of that, always looking towards the government, they're going to favor more social welfare programs and affirmative action type programs to continue helping them be on an equal le level playing field with um, the majority, the whites, and. Uh, that's the reason why they're more likely to be liberal, just because they, they look to the government to do those things. Uh, African Americans and half Hispanic Americans are more liberal. And then the other group of people who are more likely to be liberal are women. And the funny thing is women make up, there are more women than actual men. 54% of the population is women. And... They're more likely to support spending on social services and oppose military spending at a higher level, which conservatives are typically advocates of. Um, this ideological difference between men and women has also has led to this what's called the gender gap. And what a gender gap is, it, when you ever hear the word gender gap, it's referring to the regular pattern by which women are more likely to support Democratic candidates rather than Republican candidates. And a lot of times, people who are running for office, they're going to try to win the women vote because there are more of them and getting that that large minority voting in your favor can really help propel you to winning an election um, like in any type of election presidential congressional whatever it may be so women are there they, they make up a majority of the population and they still even though most Americans are conservatives uh, women are more likely to be um, liberals due to their their favorite of spending for social services and getting and not being for military. And here is just a chart that is in your book as well. Um, kind of breaks down what a liberal ideology thinking is versus a conservative ideological thinking. Um, military liberals want less less of it. Don't commit troops. Conservatives want to support a military. It be intervent intervent into military action if they need to. When it comes to abortion, social issues like abortion, prayer in school, and affirmative action, you have liberals who who want choice in abortion. They oppose prayer in school and they support having affirmative action compared to conservatives, right to life, support, and they oppose affirmative action. And you can go down the list here. Um, and as you look at this, you could ask yourself, where would I line up? Um, do I line up on liberal side, conservative side? Do I, on some things I'm, I'm liberal, sometimes conservatives. Um, 
the odds are the numbers say that you're more likely to be liberal due to your age but um, these are just some guidelines very broad, basic guidelines to see where maybe where you would fall liberally or conservative ideology thinking okay so do people think in ideological terms so when you when you are um, whenever you get the chance to vote do you think in ideological terms or do you think in some other way um, ideological thinking is not a widespread in American public nor are people necessarily consistent in their attitudes when it comes to what their ideology is they change their mind a lot <coughs> um, there was a, a study done by American voter um, that looked carefully at the ideological sophistication of American elect the American electorate in the 50s and they divided the public into four groups according to ideological sophistication and these four groups are ideologues which consists this is only 20 tw I'm sorry this is only 12 percent of Americans and these 12 percent they connect their opinions and beliefs with the broad policy positions taken by parties or candidates so when they're when these people ideologues are people who think in, ide in ideological terms they whatever they believe whatever their opinions are they take that and match it to a party or to a candidate and, and they would vote based on that whatever the party or candidate stands for that's how they would vote so only 12 percent of Americans are considered ideal ideologues 42 percent of Americans would be would fall in this group called the group of benefits voters um, which uh, these are Americans who think of politics mainly by the groups they like or dislike so I may like Democrats, so I vote for them. I don't like Republicans, I won't vote for them. Um, that's how the majority of Americans and the majority of these people in this in this uh, study done um, wind up. They vote based on a group of people they like or dislike. Not based on their ideology, but based on who they like and dislike. 24% um, of Americans think in what's called the nature of times votes. Or this is how they vote in nature of times. Um, the handle on politics, uh, the population is limited to whether the times seem good or bad to them. They think terms are good or bad. So if, basically, if if things are going really bad, who's in control? Uh, right now, the Democrats are in control. Well, well, let's get rid of them. If the Republicans are in control and things are going bad, let's get rid of them. But if things are good, we'll keep them. We'll keep them around, whatever that, whoever those are, those people are. So they think in terms of good or bad. And then last group of people the no issue content voters 22 percent of Americans vote routinely for a party or judge the the candidate by their personalities that's it um, they're not they're not looking at their their stance on policies they don't care what group they're a part of they just look at their personality and if I if it looks like a nice guy or a nice gal I'm, I'll vote for them or I won't vote for them and that's it and that's pretty high that's 22 percent I mean it's that seems like a lot of people vote just based on personality alone and that just goes back to what polls show about Americans political information that we don't we don't have a really good knowledge of um, what goes on when it comes to policies or what people believe what are people who people who people are voting for where they stands on stand on issues we just kind of go with who we like and don't like not their ideology so I'm curious what group you would fall under are you ideolo ideologue do you um, are you a group benefits voter? You vote based on who you like or don't like. Uh, nature of the times. What's going? What, if it's working, don't fix it type thing. Um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Or do you vote? Would you vote based on personality wise? Um, so you would fall into one of those categories probably. So now that we know um, what how what are the different ideologies are, conservative versus liberal. Um, how do you participate in politics? It's a good question. Political participation. This encompasses the many activities that that um, used by citizens to influence the selection of political leaders or the policies they pursue. Um, there are many opportunities for every American to participate in some form or fashion. And by participating, you're trying to select people who are going to... Um, Pursue policies that you strongly believe in. That's the idea. That's what that's what a, a a good democracy would represent. People who are who know 
what's going on, they know their stand on issues, and they vote accordingly to who represents that best. Not because of the personality, not because of who they're a part of, what group they're a part of, but what their stance are on certain policies. So there are many opportunities open to do so, to, to participate in politics. Even though there is many opportunities, only half of Americans, and this is only half Americans who are eligible to vote, not half of America, of everyone in America, but only half, 55% of Americans who are eligible to vote actually vote in presidential elections. And that number drops on average to 39% for midterm elections. And then if, if you were to, um, do you want to know, it gets, and it gets even smaller for state and local elections. I mean, like when, when people vote for the, the city of Las Vegas mayor, there's, there's only like a couple thousand people voting. And this is a two million, uh, roughly two million population here in the city of Las Vegas. So the, the lesser, I guess the smaller level of government it is, the less and less people vote and get involved. Um, but only, even at the biggest election day, which would be the presidential elections, every four years, only half of Americans who are even eligible to vote um, participate and vote. So there's many opportunities but not a lot of people do it in the first place. Okay, different types of ways you can vote. It's either conventional or unconventional. Uh, conventional participation includes a wide, um, many widely accepted modes of influencing government, and these, the ways conventionally you can participate is either by voting, trying to persuade others. If you get like a debate with someone, trying to persuade them to vote a certain way. Um, ringing doorbells for a petition or signing a petition in the parking lot or online, there's petitions online, or even running for office. These are conventional ways of participating in government, which I'm sure you've, you, would, you would think if I, were, if I were to ask you how would you, can you participate, you would probably come up with a couple of these. Um, there's also unconventional ways of participating, and these include activities that are often dramatic, um, such as protesting, civil disobedience, nonviolence, civil disobedience and violence. So protest is a form of political participation. It's designed to achieve policy change uh, through, through dramatic and unconventional tactics. And protests today are often orchestrated, orchestrated to provide, a, provide television cameras with vivid images. And I, if really, if you don't get your protest on TV, then really no one even cares or sees about it to even want to even kind of maybe get involved with your protest. So protesters, they have to do outlandish th things just to get on TV so that their message is even heard in the first place. Um, and when it comes to civil disobedience throughout American history, individuals and groups have, have used civil disobedience, which is consciously breaking a law that they think is unjust. Um, it's illustrated in different er eras by people like David um, Henry David Thor, um, in the 1840s and uh, Martin Luther King in the 50s and 60s having um, sit-ins or boycotts. Um, this, so they're civilly disobeying, disobeying the law um, to try to change things. And then you have nonviolent civil disobedience, which is, was one of the most effective techniques of civil rights movement in the South. Um, Martin Luther King's letter from a Brighamham jail is a classic defense of civil disobedience, non-civil disobedience, I should say, where you just write a letter. Um, and then lastly, political violence, um, or violence is a way of political participating um, just by destroying things and um, burning things down. That's, that's a form of participating. So you can either do it conventionally or unconventionally. Um, but both are participation are forms of participating. Um, I would even say not not even doing a thing is a form of participation. You're basically saying you don't care what what goes on. You don't care what the government does because you don't you're not going to participate anyway. So you just that's a form of that would be another unconventional I guess participation is just not not participating at all. Okay, class inequality and participation um, in the United States participation is a class based activity. Citizens of a higher socioeconomic status are going to participate more than others. The richer you are, the more educated you are, um, the older you are, you're more likely to participate. Um, and the opposite is true for if you don't do any of those things, you're less likely to participate. Um, and these are more likely going to be minority groups. Um, minority groups like Hispanics and African Americans are below average when, when it comes to terms of political participation. They don't participate as much as... Um, 
White's would. However, this gap has been, the gaps between groups and national average has been declining over the years. And even when blacks, Hispanics, and whites are, are on equal income and education, um, it is the minorities that who participate more often in politics than the actual whites, if they're all on equal. So even though whites with higher incomes and education participate more than minorities, it's been dwindling down that the gap between the two have been dwindling and when it's on equal ground, the minorities are more likely to vote or participate, not just vote, but participate than um, their counterparts. So there you go. That's the way of participating. That's how Americans um, participate in politics, um, either conventionally or unconventionally, and it's based on uh, class and um, it's class-based um, bias there, who participates and who does not participate. And that's it. So these are the key terms for this con and concepts from this chapter. And um, there you go. That's the end of this video lecture.